Welcome back to Comic Book History. This is episode number 22. And in this episode, we're talking about two groups. The second group is just a continuation of the first group. And this first group is the All-Star Squadron. Uh, created by Tom Jarrett and Rich Buckler. They made their first appearance in Justice League America, number 193, as basically a backup story. Now, the story is pretty simple. It's just that, well, the story opens up, and this is a pretty cool story how it opens up. It opens up with the three characters who was a lead feature of a comic book known as Ka uh, Comic Clavicade. Yeah, it's a comic that's similar to uh, World's Finest, simply just another book, just the third book featuring uh, these three characters. Kind of like their own separate trinity in a way. It's it, The book itself didn't last too long. It lasted for a few short years. It got canceled. But the three main features of the book were, well, they, they also included the Atom at a few, for several of the issues, but the three main features were Alan Scott, the Green Lantern, Jay Garrick, the Flash, and the Golden Age Wonder Woman. Where these three are just sitting on a beach. They're just actually sitting on a beach. They're just sitting like a, like a hilltop and just having a, neat, a nice, interesting conversation. And then Solomon Grundy shows up. No, seriously, Solomon Grundy. And this is actually... Uh, chronologically, this is set before Sal McGrundy made his first appearance in All American Comics number 62. When Alan Scott first made him, he's like, Who the heck is this guy? Yeah, well, Sal McGrundy is actually from a few years in the future. Yeah, he's from a few years in the future. So, and so they decided to, well, yeah, this is actually part of a plan by a guy named Per Degadon. I actually didn't reference him now. I wanted to save him for this. He, he's actually one of the villains recruited by him to take out the Justice Society to revenge his previous defeats. Yeah, he got defeated uh, a couple times by, by the JSA in the 40s. So, he decided to get revenge on them by kidnapping them. No, seriously, that's what they did. So, they kidnapped them the day Pearl Harbor was attacked. Yeah, just by sheer coincidence. And then, um, FDR uh, is trying to call up the JSA headquarters like, trying to get their help deal with the Japanese, but they couldn't get any of their help. So he did something quite interesting. Let's contact America's mystery men. Yeah, in common people like Johnny Quick, uh, Liberty Bell, a uh, bunch of characters. Uh, they threw in, um, let's see, who else they threw in? They threw in like Amazing Man, Shining Knight, Robot Man. Later on, they threw in the Tarantula, uh, Commander Steel. Which is a character created by Jerry Conway. Um, they threw in a bunch of characters, people who not been officially with, fairly with any of your team before. But here's the full list of them that they threw in. Basically, excuse me, they threw these characters in but had no previous affiliation. They threw in Airwave, which is the original Airwave, Amazing Man, Will Everett, uh, the original Blackhawk, the Blue Beetle. This is the Dan Gary Blue Beetle. Uh, Blue Boys, Captain Triumph, of course, Commander Steel, Dr. Cult, Firebrand, and this was the uh, second Firebrand. Her brother was the previous one, so they threw in his sister, who apparently developed attraction to uh, the Shining Knight. Yeah. Uh, they also had the Guardian, Jim Harper. This is, of course, the original version. The, the clone version showed up in the 2000s, and he was allegedly his son. And, of course, you have Janice Harper, who was his daughter, who lived with him in the, in the, in the 2000s. We also have the original Hawk Girl, Shabra Saunders. Of course, Johnny Quick. The original Jutna Master. This was, of course, after Crest and Infinite Earths. The King. Uh, Liberty Bell, obviously. Little Boy Blue. Uh, Little Miss Redhead. Uh, Paul Kirk, the original Manhunter. Merlin the Magician. Mr. America slash American Commander. He's actually referenced in the JSA series. Uh, Quicksilver. Actually, Max Mercury, by the way. Yeah, they changed the Max Mercury in order to avoid a copyright strike from Marvel. Uh, Ma Hinkle, Red Tornado, Word to a Man, Sandy the Golden Boy, Sorgon Sorcerer, Speed Saunders, The Tarantula, the tag of this, of course, at the Crest of Infinite Earths, uh, TNT, Tor the Magic Master, Whip, and uh, Giovanni Satana, the father of Zatanna Zadara, the, the gorgeous sorceress who learned to win the JLA in the 1970s. So these guys were recruited, and one thing quite neat about this series is they integrated previous established 
publication into the canon of this particular series. Like, they reference stuff happening in Detective Comics. Like, in the case of Johnny Quick, this is, like, right after his debut. So they just threw it in there. And there's always frequent editor notes because Roy Thomas had previously worked as an editor. So he was the editor of the All-Star Squadron series. And he wrote the entire series himself. And later on, they threw in Aquaman. Uh, just before Crisis and Infinite Earths happened. This is, of course, the Earth 2 version. He very he only appeared toward the end of the series. He did Jack Squad comic book. But uh, they had very different writers on it, like Jerry Conway, who wrote a couple issues. Uh, mainly deal with the character Steel, because he previously wrote the character, so why not? Uh, I'll see. They threw in the other writers were Paul Kepperberg, who wrote issues 41, 41 and 44. Mike Berlin, who did issues did issue 43. And Roy Thomas's wife, Dan Thomas, who did issues 46, 51, and 53, 55. The, the artists were Rich Beckler, Adrian Gonzalez, Don Hick, Jerry Ordway, uh, Richard Hodwell, Rick Hodderberg, Avril Jones, Keith Giffen, Kama Infantino, Don Newton, Martin Noodle, George Perez, Tom McFarlane, yeah, this is one of his early assignments, Mike Harris, Mike Clark, Tony Zugula, Mike Blur, Wayne Boring, and Alan Copperberg. Yeah, a lot of artists for these 67 issues, and it's a good thing Roy Thomas stayed in as the writer-editor of the book. Uh, of course, this is also the same time Conway was doing um, Firestorm. Yeah, these guys fought. Now, here's the thing about the series. Every issue began with basically a particular date. Like, it took like almost a year and a half just to get get out of um, the the gap December of 1940. The series was very serialized. That's one thing you got that's one thing you gotta know about the series. The series is very serialized and they didn't feature the JSA that much in the series because they had the character sort of retire. And Roy Thomas wanted to focus on the other characters aside from the JSA to sort of develop them. And you can thank him for basically indirectly creating Jesse Quick, even though she didn't she was created by a different person in the nineteen nineties, nineteen eighty two series of of the of the Just Side America, but you can thank Roy Thomas for hooking up Johnny Quick and Liberty Bell. Yep. So thank you, Roy Thomas, for for that. So for those of you fans, Justy Quick, thank Roy Thomas for for allowing this to happen, for allowing her to be created. Yep. And th these are 67 really awesome issues. The series even also had three annuals published. Yeah. And throughout these 67 issues. These were very well serialized, like I said, serialized issues. Took place heavily in World War II, and uh, there's even uh, an issue that took place in an actual real life event where um, w w Winston Churchill. They actually met Winston Churchill and FDR during the course of the series, um, where he gave a speech to them. Actually, in real life, he gave this to on the same train, but to a, a crowd of people. Yeah, it's actually uh, mentioned in one of the issues, but yeah. And it even got to the point where the group got so large. No, seriously, the group got so humongous. It's like Roy Thomas doing every single hero who appeared in the Golden Age of Comics, even though that characters like the Tarantula and Commander Steel technically did not, but they're from that era, so he threw them in as well. And this is the original Tarantula, Jonathan Law, not the woman who raped Nightwing. In Nightwing number 93, this is a completely different character. It's his, pre it's her predecessor, and Nightwing actually lived in his apartment building uh, when, when when he was living in Bloodhaven. Yeah, I had to throw that out there. But and his original costume was actually a costume originally supposed to go to Sandman. Yeah, the costume was made by Sandman's lifelong partner, uh, Dana Beaumont, uh, was which was originally for the Sandman, but. Uh, Sandman didn't want the costume, so Tarantula just like, okay, I'll take the costume, and that became his original costume. So you can thank Sandman for the Tarantula. And, I mean, a lot of the time they fight a lot of, like, Golden Age villains. Super villains, like, excuse me, they fought not only Solomon Grundy and Perdigodon, they also fought Vandal Savage, the Ultra Humanite, which they actually retconned the original story, which he, he debuted. Basically, Ultra Humanite was originally who was a Superman villain. They retconned him to being a JSA villain, thanks to All-Star Squadrons. But it's 67 issues of awesomeness. And then after Crisis and the Earth, they pretty much got rid of a lot of characters and replaced them with um, 
They decided to relaunch the book as Young All-Stars. Yep. After 67 issues, they relaunched as Young All-Stars. The book itself didn't last too long. So the book got canceled after 31 issues. Now, Roy Thomas did write the book. He wrote it, the whole series, with Dan Thomas as co-plotter, with Mike Burr, Mike, Mike, Michael Blar as the artist, and Brian Mur. Yeah, they, these four people created the Young All-Stars. Which, uh, they decided to have, um, a few people basically replace noteworthy characters. They had, uh, Flying Fox, a Canadian superhero, replaced Batman because of Crisis of Nerves. Uh, Fury, this is, of course, the predecessor to the female character Fury, who later married, uh, uh, Hank Hall in the Infinite Ink series. Uh, he, she was meant to, she became retconned to be one, uh, her mother over the Golden Age Wonder Woman. And, let's see... Neptune Perkins, who replaced uh, Aquaman, and Iron Monroe, they had him replace um, Superman, the Golden Age Superman. They have a few new characters, along with Dan, Dan, the Dyna, Dan Dynamite. Uh, let's see, who else? Uh, Tigress, who was a um, former villainess, and Tsunami, who, who actually married Neptune Perkins. It was a pretty interesting set of characters. And the group themselves were sort of like the new upcoming heroes, basically, who formed just after World War II ended. And Crisis Universe already happened, so, yeah. And they even had an issue, which tied into um, Millennium, which had Paul Kirk take on Dan Richards. They're, these two guys were both Manhunters. And they actually fought it. They had the same, if, if you read the issue, they, they look like they had the same exact costume. Now, there's kind of a reason for this. Because... Uh, originally, Paul Kirk was not the Manhunter. Originally, he was just the PI, and DC made him the Manhunter after they bought Quality Comics. That's the only reason why, and they actually had him physically... They never met in the, in the original publication period when the Golden Age happened. They never physically met, but thanks to all the young All-Stars, and thank you, Roy Thomas, for letting this to happen, you had the first two Manhunters meet. And they fought, and they actually met up with the Code of Manhunters, which actually existed far back as the 40s, surprisingly. And they told them to just stop fighting. They could both be Manhunter, perfectly fine. So they had the two guys join two separate teams. Uh, they had, um, let's see, I think they had, uh, let's see if I can find it here. Yeah. They had, um, let me find it here. Here we go. They had Dan Richards join the Freedom Fighters, uh, and they had Paul Kirk stay with the All Star Squad. They both were members of the All Star Squad, but uh, Dan Richards went to the Freedom Fighters. So there. Um, but my guess is the series wasn't successful as, let's say, the All Star Squad, and that's probably the reason why the book got canceled at the 31 issues. That's my personal guess, but was that a terrible series? No, it was actually really dang good. I actually read online. It was really good. But yeah, um, after the group ended, there wasn't much left to do with the All-Star Squadrons. Now, after the series ended, the, the group themselves still remained referenced across DC Universe. They reckoned the character Spider, who was a member of the um, Freedom Fires, they reckoned him in the Shade series uh, as a member of the All-Star Squadron. I don't know why they did. And they also changed him for being uh, a villain who posed as a hero. And apparently he was on one of the Ludlows and the Shade killed him. Yeah, the Shade killed him in the last issue of his miniseries. Um, yeah, but this, these two series were really good. And now to talk about the trade situation when it comes to these two series. All-Star Squadron has got one trade. One trade. And it's a Showcase Presents book which collects the first 18 issues of the series, the first annual, and their introduction from Just League America number 193. Now, there was a crossover with the issue of the JLA. Uh, I think it's issue 219, I believe it is. And for some reason, I have no idea why DC did this. They did not include the JLA issue they crossed out with, because when you read the issue, when you read the book, you're like, you, you get to that point, like, okay, Continued in Just League America, I think it's like 2.19. And, they, and then all of a sudden, oh, it's the next issue. I'm like, you're, you're like, where, is there like a, a note of what happened in the issue? Nope. 
It's kind of like DC just didn't care at all with the All-Star Squadron. Young All-Stars has never received a trade. Never. Never, ever received a trade. I have no idea why. And the fact the series is, was concluded almost 30 years ago. Yeah. The, the group themselves are 30 years old this year. And the series ended back in 1989. Yeah. So it's been a uh, little over 20 years. It's been almost 30 years since the series ended. And no trade? Really, DC? And... I would think though, when they when they ended the cease when the cease publication the showcase presents where after they released uh, showcase presents Blue Beetle, they released trades for all those squadrons. But there has not been anything really these these characters. I mean, Infinity which I'll talk about them in a couple episodes. They got two trades, and that's it. Um, the only thing else that Roy Thomas wrote that's received a trade is the um, Shazam: A New Beginning series, which just received a trade recently. And also the America vs. Justice Society, that's been collected in trade. The one-shot uh, Last Days of the Justice Society of America, that was collected in America vs. Justice Society. But not much else. Yeah, for some reason DC does not want to treat Dan Thomas with the proper respect when it comes to trades. Yeah, they throw in stuff like Batman, Superman, all these other characters, but what about the All-Star Squadron? Can't these guys get a trade? I mean... How long would it take DC to put this, this this series in trade? It'd probably take about seven trades. Seven volumes of a trade to collect this entire series. Young All-Star is probably take about two or three at most to collect all 31 issues and the one annual the series published. And I keep thinking, though, why couldn't they collect this? Who knows? Uh, maybe DC's lazy when it comes to these trades. But... I kind of wish DC would collect more of the All-Star Squadron because it's a really dang good series to read. And it is just so, so good. Roy Thomas treats these character with so much respect. And yet DC does treat, just treat the series with respect at all. I mean, am I expecting the series to come back? No. I actually don't want the series to come back as an ongoing series. It's not kind of necessary. We have the JSA coming back. We don't need the All-Star Squadron to come back at all. You can have like a mini series for these characters, not an ongoing one. But one thing they really need is trades. Lots of trades. To collect this entire series, along with Young All Stars, which is the follow up to it. These two series need to be fully put into trade. Come on, DC, get on it. I haven't seen anything pop up on Amazon for All Star Squadron aside from the Showcase Presents book. I mean, come on, it's not very hard to put these series into trade. I mean, just do it. Just put the series in trade for cry out loud. I'm sure people would buy it. What, the Showcase Presents All-Star Squadron Volume 1 not get many sales? Is that the reason why we haven't seen many All-Star Squadron trades? Is because this one book got low sales? Is that the reason why? Who knows? But, really, DC, put this series in the new printing trade. I mean, you're doing it with Catwoman. You're doing it Asriel. I mean, the only non-bat books you're putting into trade, these new printing trades, people like, series like Hellblazer, uh, Supergirl's getting it. I know Superman's getting some new trades. Uh, but aside from that, that's really it. Oh yeah, uh, just like the, the, uh, the Justice League America's getting some new trades. Um, but not very much that's non-Batman related. But come on, Batman was in All-Star Squadron. I would think they would do it, but nope. I guess not. They don't care to do it. I mean, come on, DC. Give Roy Thomas more love when it comes to trades. Don't just do a handful of trades and just, just, just shrug it off like that's it. I mean, come on, Conway doesn't get many trades. I mean, he just got, just, just, just recently, he's got a trade now coming out, which collects his Batman run. And yet his steel run has never been collected in trade, and yet his first flying for Firestorm is collected in trade, but not, his, but not his run he did for the second flying of the series. It's like certain writers need a lot more love when it comes to trades. Roy Thomas, Gary Conway, and Paul Kupperberg are, are a few people I can think of who could use more love when it comes to trades. Okay? Heck, even Jerry Ordway needs more trades, because his Power Shazam series has never put... Well, one issue has. Actually, two issues have been... Uh, one issue that crossed up with uh, Starman and the Blackest Night Titan. 
that's it. There's no regular trades. I mean, yeah, there is that one book that came out prior to the series, but that just that is just a giant size. That, that, that just a hardcover one shot. I'm talking about the 41 issue comic book. It will take you just a few trades just to do it. Just do it. But it's one of those series that a lot of seeing trade, but who knows when DC would actually do it? All right. So uh, that's it for this episode. Uh, next episode, I'm gonna talk about something. I'm gonna talk about the DC implosion. I've referenced it a couple times the last couple episodes. I might go a little, go a little more in detail of what DC implosion was. Okay. But uh, then in the following episode after that, we'll talk about Infinity Inc., the first and second volume of the series, and what happens to the characters afterwards. Okay? But until then, I will see you there. Bye.